Um, so this morning, I want to introduce to you our, our guest speaker, uh, Pastor Chris Ball and his wife, Carol. I found out we have a special connection. We all have the same birthday, all three of us, uh, December 25th, okay? So that's, that's how you know the anointing is on them here, right? And um, so Pastor, Pastor Chris, uh, he has been, for the last nine years, he was the, he was the head of the Elim Fellowship which is kind of like the Assemblies of God, but uh, they, they have a real strong emphasis in missions, that, which we do too, but they, he's, he's got a heart for missions, a heart for the Lord, and a heart for pastors. And he started a ministry that, that ministers to pastors, and, and right now he's working at a church in New York. And so uh, I know the Lord is, is moving in his life, doing incredible things in his life, and uh, I want to invite him to come and bring the word to us this morning. So Pastor Chris, if you'd come. And so excited to have you. Can you give him a hand as well? Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Good morning. I think I pushed the right button. You can hear me now? Good, great. Well, this is just wonderful being here in North Carolina. I, uh, I was born in England and grew up in Hampton, Virginia, Newport News area. And then uh, went up to New York where I felt the Lord calling me to pastor. So we went to a Bible college uh, up in upstate New York near Rochester and uh, met my wife Carol there. She's from uh, Flemington, New Jersey, and your new pastor is from Patterson, New Jersey. They're like right next to each other. And, uh, and so uh, and, uh, on the way down, Carol and I, we got to listen to your pastor do the Top Gun series. Uh, that was pretty cool, wasn't it? Uh, and and uh, just uh, the whole mindset of this church having uh, the spirit of faith and wanting to embrace faith. And uh, you're a good preacher, brother. And I'm, I'm not just saying that, but I, we enjoyed it. And uh, in fact, uh, Carol got saved in the Assembly of God in 1983 and uh, radically saved in Flemington, New Jersey. And then I would have never liked her before that, uh, you know. And, and she would, believe me, she would not have liked me either. <laughs> and, uh, but we, we fell in love at Bible College and, uh, and then uh, pastored for 30 years and in a little town. Population of our town, a little bit smaller than uh, this town here, is 127. Uh, that was the town. I'm serious. And we went into this church that was birthed in 1831. And it was a very denominational church. And uh, 30 years later, we built $4 million worth of buildings, and God increased that church and blessed that church. And it's going on today with our assistant pastor. He took over the church, he and his wife. And, uh, and as your pastor mentioned, I had the privilege of being uh, the president for the last uh, 10 years, nine years, uh, it was nine years, and, uh, and then uh, out of that, um, before that, I, I was what they call the general secretary, so it's like, it's very microcosm to the assembly of God, but it's the same nature, it's the same DNA, and, uh, and uh, we're just glad to be here. We obviously are here because you have, some of you like these people here, I know some don't, but because you've told me in the doorway, uh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> You didn't say that. You just said, uh, if, if he's a friend of yours and uh, mine, then, he's, then we're friends. And we have felt a real warm welcome. I leaned over to pastor during worship and said, wow, what a wonderful spirit in this house. And uh, sometimes you just need somebody from the outside that doesn't even know you to come in. I mean, not just anybody, but somebody that's been around a little bit. And, uh, and I just want to say, there's a good spirit. It started when we walked in the door. It didn't start with worship, just want you to know that, and it just continued, and uh, hopefully I don't ruin it. Uh, you know, I turned, when they said turn and greet people, I, I turned to uh, your, your daughter, your youngest daughter there, and, um, and she said to me, she said, uh, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, I need it right now, don't I? <laughs> I love it, man. I thought that was great. But anyway, well, it's good to be here, as Pastor said. Now, I'm, I've, just re I've always loved pastors. I mean, since uh, I lived in Virginia Beach, worked for the 700 Club, and, uh, and during that time, um, I just fell in love with pastors. And uh, a pastor was used by God to, to change my life. And I, I, ever since then, I've felt like I just love pastors. Never thought I'd be one. 
and, uh, and uh, God is now allowing Carol and I, I mean, I did this quite a bit throughout the movement of those 30 years because, you know, 127 people, 36 people in the church. I mean, we grew to, uh, I told Pastor, uh, you know, we count them when they're dead, actually, sometimes, you know, the numbers, but, uh, but, uh, but we, had, we had a consistent 350 people coming when we, when we left and, um, and uh, debt-free, never got into debt with all that debt that we uh, raised, we never got into debt with buildings and stuff. But I always loved pastors, Carol and I both. We just love leaders, and now that's what we want to do. Somebody said to me, now you, you know, you're 64. She's 64, too, but she looks 32, so let's just get that right. We were born the same day. I was born in England, and she was born in Jersey, and your pastor, where were you born? Maryland, but a little bit after that. I'm, we're much older than you. But, uh, but now, somebody said to me, what would you like to do? And I said, I just would love to continue to touch pastors and be, be with pastors. A lot of pastors just don't have anybody to talk with. And uh, I want to be that friend. And so we're starting a ministry called Tend Ministries. I'm not going to plug that. I'm not here for that. I'm here just to come and hopefully bring something that will bless you. I told your pastor, Pastor Dave, I said, when I, I get to travel, that was a lot of what my job was as a president, uh, besides running the thing. But, um, but, but we have, you know, uh, 900 credential holders, 900 pastors, leaders, missionaries, and stuff like that. Uh, and uh, and the, some of the churches would invite me. And, um, but not every church would I preach this word. This is a word the Lord gave me while I was sitting in Africa on a couch with one of my best friends. And he gave me this word. He said, you need to pray before you go anywhere, before you preach this word. And I, I heard your pastor preaching about faith. And I, I, I want you to know, I, I, there's places I have not preached this word, but I felt led to preach this word here. Because I see something going on, and even when you said, let's blow the roof off, man, that's, that's good, man. Uh, that's kind of the spirit of what I want to talk about this morning. Um, you know, there are two conversations going on right now. In fact, uh, one of my biggest prayers is that the church behave itself a little more during this campaign. I'm not going to talk politics because I don't even know what I believe anymore. But, uh, I mean, I know God and all that. But, but, but at the end of the day, uh, and you're a kingdom man, I know that. Because I heard you say that in one of your sermons. And, and that's where I'm at. I, I never touch the top politics things, but I, w I will say this, I love the church, and the church didn't do a really good job. There's two conversations going on, and you, you can find this through Barner Research, you can find it by, like me, getting around, and, and uh, one of them is saying that, oh my goodness, all these pastors are quitting. All these pastors are just saying, well, what are we doing? People leaving the church, because they just feel like fed up because of the tension of the country in particular, but it's around the world too. The other side of the conversation is like this. People are saying, don't throw your hands up when it gets difficult, step up to the plate. And I sense that from your pastor's preaching, that's what this kind of church might be like, which led me to want to preach this message. Because you don't want to waste a message on somebody who says, let's quit. Are you with me? And I believe that God has called me to uh, bring this message to you today because you're a church that doesn't want to quit. Don't throw up your hands when it gets difficult. This is a divine opportunity. This is time for the church to show itself. This is time for the church to behave like a kingdom church. And uh, a guy named Levi Lusco in Montana says this. He says, what a day we live in. It's, it's a real honor to be trusted by God to lead in this time. That's, God, that's what God's saying to you, I believe. He says, I'm going to trust you. you. You brought a new person on board. We're, we're, we're adding something to this church. We're not saying, let's get rid of it. You know what I'm saying? We're adding. And the title of my message is Divine Addition. Divine Addition. I hadn't talked with God about that. I said, I like multiplication better. He said, well, my addition's better than your multiplication. It's divine addition. Because all those years that Pastor Carol and I, that we, that we uh, 
you know, serve that little church and watched it grow. I can tell you 30 years later, you've been there 50 years, it's God that causes the increase. We water, we plant, but God causes the increase. It's a divine addition. He added daily to the church. Come on. And I believe God wants to do that. Now, when you're listening today, I told your pastor this is what I was going to say. When you're listening to this word today, I want, you to, I want you to think not about growing this church, but about growing yourself. The divine addition has to start with us. It has to start in us. God wants to bring divine addition to this house, but it starts with me. Are you with me? And I have to be open to that. When I thought, you know, when I, I was sitting on that couch in Africa, in Kenya, and I was writing four sermons, getting ready to start to become the president 10 years ago. Now, I haven't preached this everywhere, like I said. But as I wrote this message, the Lord said, I want you to look at the greatest illustration of divine addition in the whole Bible. And he said, this is it. When I added Jesus to the church in real body, when I brought an addition i.e. Jesus. He was not added like he wasn't before. The Trinity we believe, right? But now I'm going to take a moment for 33 years and bring him in to show you how to do church. That's what it was all about. And of course, die on the cross and save us from our sins. But mainly to model something. Model how we can behave and live in a kingdom life in a human body. How we can reach out to the Holy Spirit in the same way. Let me show you how to do that, he said. And then he baptizes us and so forth and so on. And I, and I found that addition showing up. And whenever divine addition starts to happen in a church, it doesn't always go so easy. So I looked at John chapter 3. You know, we talk about 316, but John chapter 3, verses 22 through 30. Let me tell you what's happening there before I read it. Because sometimes you read it and then you go, well, that was cute. But, but at the end of the day, this is what's really happening. John the Baptist has been doing his thing, baptizing people. We've already had the experience by the time we read chapter 3. We've already had the experience. We go to Nicodemus, Nick at night, Nicodemus. And, uh, and, 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 and we already hear how he turns away from God a little bit, didn't receive we know how to be born again. We know that disciples are starting to be picked, and Jesus is starting to be added to the scene. Got it? Divine addition. He's divine addition. And he's, he's in the scene. And all of a sudden, now there's disciples of John the Baptist. There's disciples of Jesus. We know them. We don't know the disciples of John the Baptist, but there are disciples. You'll see it in a second. And they start to say, hey, who's this new dude? Now, we'd be glad for him to show up. But they were like, who is this new addition? He, hey, J.B., John the Baptist. Aren't you the one that baptizes? This dude's baptizing. He's doing stuff that you were doing. Seems a little odd. He's playing guitar. I'm the guitar person on worship team. The real tall dude, right? Got it? Hey. Divine addition isn't always accepted by those who ask for it. They're asking God to move in that house, and Jesus comes by, and they start getting frustrated, and the disciples start debating each other about stuff. And John the Baptist gives us a sermon, and it's not my sermon, it's his sermon I want to preach to you. And this is how it goes. After these things, after the wilderness, after the heavenly announcement, after all that, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea where he remained with them, and he baptized. Shame on him. Now, John, you'll see the shame on him in a second. Now, John also was baptizing in, 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 in Anion near Salim because there was much water there, and they came and they were baptized, for John had not yet been thrown into prison. 25, verse 25. And there arose a dispute. Here it is. A dispute between some of John's disciples 
and the Jews about purification. And they came to John now, and they didn't talk about that dispute, and they begin to bring up another one. And they say, look. And they came to John, and they said, Rabbi, he who is with you beyond the Jordan to whom you have tested, in the Greek, I've read it. It says, behold, I'll, I'll, I'll give it to you how it is. He's baptizing, explanation point. They weren't happy about it. We like JB. They came and they asked him, he who is with you in the Jordan to whom you have testified, behold, he's baptizing. And watch this. They're all coming to him now. They like him better than me. Better than you, JB. John answered and said, a man can receive nothing. This is his sermon. A man can receive nothing unless it's been given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear witness from me that from the very beginning, I've been saying I am not the Christ, but I've been sent before him. I've got a different job. And he who is the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. I love the New Living Translation version. He says, I'm the best man. He's the bridegroom. I'm just the best man. I'm not the Christ. I've been sent before him. Verse 30. You know this verse. He must increase. And I must decrease. Divine addition must increase. But I must decrease. I want to give you four insights from these passages right here for those verses. That I think John the Baptist is trying to tell his disciples. I want divine addition to come to this house to come to our lives. But here's what you need to know. Number one, verse 27. A man can receive nothing unless it's been given to him from God. Here's the first point. You must know that what I have must come from God. Anything that gets added to our life isn't just about what you get from education, talent, study, or whatever. Is it from God? If it's going to happen in divine addition. Because there's a lot of people who can speak good and have no business behind this pulpit. Is it from God? Is the call from God? I guarantee you, I don't even know. I have heard nothing about this brother here, but I guarantee you the elders of this church prayed and they sought him. They didn't just do it because they know the sister-in-law. They said, this is from God. You got to understand that it's from God. And brother, when it gets tough, you got to know this is from God. You got to know What you have, because you can build a ladder. You've heard that illustration up against the wrong wall because you did it on your own, and it wasn't from God. God never told you to put the ladder there in the first place. The idea here is, do you know that what you have has been given to you, and you're confident that God's in it? You got to know that. You got to know that. God wants you to know that. You know, if if you do it, you got to protect it. If God gives it to you, he protects it. Isn't that cool? If God's, God says in 1 Corinthians uh, 2, ch- uh, 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 4, verse 1, he says, add to, your mer- uh, add to your faith mercy. You see, God will add stuff to your lives, but then you don't have to, you don't have to protect that. He's got angels all around protecting that. Are you hearing me? You don't have to fight for your name if it's a divine addition. Ultimately, the question is, do I know in my knower that it came from heaven? That's what John the Baptist was telling his disciples. And I know that what you see with this new guy baptized, it came from heaven. And I know that what I see going on in my life came from heaven. That way, you're not going to be jealous of the people that walk into this house that do some of the things that you do. You know, you can get jealous just let Letting them sit in your pew. Oh, my goodness, man. You say, oh, please, bring them to church. Bring them to church. A hundred people show up, and they all sit in your pews. And and you have fun saying, this ain't fun. Then you got to know, did this come from God? Are you hearing me? And if you can't handle the pew sitting, you're not going to handle when somebody comes in and is a better worship leader than you. Now, this was a great team today. I'm not saying anything about them. They're good. 
But if you grow big you, and you go to four services on a Sunday morning, you're going to need some new worship leaders. Are you hearing me? You can't just put them up there because they play good or sing good. It's got to come from heaven. Are you with me? Because they will only give away what comes from God when it comes from God. So the first point is this. You got to know that what you have comes from God. Turn to somebody and say, you got to know what you have comes from God. Amen? Don't you hate it when preachers tell you to turn to somebody and say that? <laughs> Leaders do not choose. Rather, they respond to God's choosing. Listen, leaders do not choose. This was written by a guy named Mark Sayers, who's into revival, and he's a revivalist from New Zealand. And he says this, leaders do not choose, rather they respond to God's choosing. Our responsibility is to relinquish ourselves from all the choices and find his choice. It's like, I don't know if you have it here, but we have che Cheesecake Factory. Do you have that around? I mean, it's in some county somewhere. Man, you go to there and order something from there, it takes an hour and a half just to read the menu. You got so many choices. You shouldn't be choosing whether you should go to this church. You want to know if God's called you to this church. You got lots of choices down, down these parts. We can go here, we can go here. No, God, this addition in my life to come to this church, I got to know God called me to come here today. Your pastor's been so welcoming to me, and I just met him. God chose. Number two, verse 28. So I must know what I have must come from God. Number, verse 28. You yourselves bear witness, John the Baptist said, that I've been saying from the beginning, that's my addition to that, I am not the Christ. He's the Christ. I've been saying it from the beginning. Second lesson John the Baptist is saying. If divine addition is going to come to my life and your life, I got to know it comes from God. Number two, I must know who I am and who I'm not. You got to know who you are and who you're not. The reason I'm bringing this message to you is because you haven't seen the addition like you're going to see it. And you better have this established. I must know who I am and who I'm not. You can't be trying to be somebody you're not. I've had the privilege over the years to be uh, a real privilege, Carol, and I've had to, because of my heart for leaders, I found myself in divinely in places, and I became pretty close friends with John Maxwell. Remember that guy? So when I started preaching, I tried, I tried to preach like John Maxwell. I, I had a good imitation of him every Sunday morning. I could laugh like him, ha, 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 ha. And there wasn't a single thing about my preaching that had to do with God. I was trying to be somebody else because I was too insecure to be who I was. You got to know who you are and who you're not. I'm not John Maxwell. God said to me, I didn't send John Maxwell to South Butler, New York, population 127. I sent you, and I know who you are. Are you hearing me? You got to know who you are and who you're not. And you, got, you can't try to be somebody you're not because you don't fit in those shoes. Are you with me? I'll pick on somebody safe. What's your name again? You're, you can't, you're the lady. Yes. Janique? That's what I said. <laughs> All right. Listen, I don't know you. These folks don't know you. So that I'm using you because I think you're safe. I don't want to offend anybody, okay? Listen, when God made you, this is what he said. Y'all listen up now. He said, I'll never do that again. Because I did it right the first time. And I don't need two of you. I only need one of you. And I, you got to know who I created you in your, in your mama's womb. You got to know what I did. So don't try to live a life to try to impress all these people. They won't invite me back. I'm telling them, behave themselves right now. But here's the deal. You just be you. Don't try to come up and try to be some identity of some pastor's wife and all that kind of stuff. I know you've been serving before, but I'm just saying this is a new place, a new day. Be yourself because God made you well. 
Come on, all right? So be yourself. Number two, I must know who I am and who I'm not. Know who you are and who you're not. And, and I'm not perfect, man. I, ask Carol. You got an hour? Okay. I mean, I'm just a mess sometimes. And, uh, and it wasn't until I started to become who I knew God created me to be that we saw growth in our church. We saw growth in me first and then growth in the church. Are you hearing me? You got to know who you are and who you're not. Number three, verse 29, says this. He who has the bride, this is the part where Jesus says in the living, New Living Translation, I'm, I'm, I'm the best man. He who is the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom stands with the bridegroom and hears his voice. Third lesson, I must know what I'm called to do and what I'm not called to do. You got to know who you are and who you're not, but you got to know what you're called to do because you can get your business in somebody else's lane. And if you're not careful, that causes some tension. Are you with me? My, John the Baptist says, my job is just to stand there as the best man and hear him say, I'm going to marry the church. And that's good enough for me to be able to hear the bridegroom say, you gotta be settled with your job. You gotta be settled with your job. When Carol and I went to South Butler, we were there and they lit candles every service, genuflected. I walked down the aisle for, since 1831 till that point, 77 pastors. I was the first pastor to ever serve communion in that church because they didn't believe a pastor should serve communion. It's the elders who have the authority. It was a traditional church. Three hymns and we're done. By the end of the communion message from one of the elders, I had four minutes to preach. Serious, right, Carol? And... Um, Carol said, well, let's, let's see if they'll like worship. So she brought her guitar one Sunday, and she snuck it in there during the offering. And she started singing, what a mighty God we serve. Remember those days? Come on now. What a mighty God we serve. That's enough. It's giving me a headache. All right. Uh, but, 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 uh, but you know what I'm talking about, right? So, and as the deer panteth for all that stuff, right? They hadn't sung that in that church. It was three hymns and out, and the hymns were glorious. They were wonderful, but God was doing something new. He was divinely adding something different in the church. He takes away, and he adds stuff all the time. There's going to probably be some things in the next several months that need to come away so you can have room for the addition. Are you with me? And so what happens is, is uh, Carol starts singing at you. So on the way home, this is what we pastors do. We say, honey, how did I preach today? And she said, it was amazing. It was absolutely fantastic. Well, it probably wasn't that strong, but anyway. And she said, how did you like the worship? And this, this is what I said, pastor, this is what I said. Pray for me. I said, I think what a mighty gar God was too slow. I think you're going to sped that up a bit. We had intense fellowship all the way home. <laughs> right, Sarah? Intense fellowship. All the way home. Yeah. Next week. How did I do today, honey? Did you think I preached good today? She was a little quieter, and she said, it was okay. I mean, it was good, and then I said, oh, how was the worship? Uh, I thought as the deer, seven times through was enough, 14 times is too much. Intense fellowship all the way home, <laughs> you know, and so we We've started fighting all the time. We come home from church, have good church service, and fight all the way home. Just all the time. And uh, so we went to the elders for counsel. 
and they agreed with her that I was trying to control. And I said, well, that's why you never go to the elders for counsel. So we got a professional counselor eventually. This is years ago now. Uh, this is true, isn't it, Carol? How many know she needs lots of prayer? We needed counseling because she needed therapy. And because uh, anybody that married to me needs therapy. And uh, we went, and the counselor said this, spirit-filled counselor. She said, this is 30 years ago, 35 years ago. You're trying to be the Holy Spirit for your wife. She starts crying, which is not fair. And at the end of the day, um, she said, I, I want to tell you what you need to do. You need to define your lane and stay in it. And don't go in each other's lanes unless you're invited. That saved my marriage. Our marriage. It saved our marriage. I'm telling you right there. She was in charge of worship divinely. I'm the pastor. I'm the head of the house. Glory to me. I mean, God. No. She has the Holy Spirit. And I'm not junior Holy Spirit. Are you hearing me? She wants my opinion, which she never asked for. Why? Stay in your lane and don't go into each other's lane unless you've been invited. Saved our marriage. I'm serious. And she did tons better than I would have ever dreamed. She took our spirit into the worship and depths of worship that I would have just said, and I've been worried about how many times we're singing a song. Come on. Are you hearing me? So you got to know what you're called to do and what you're not called to do. And she was called to lead the worship. I was called to do what I was called to do. She was called to do, you know, we did everything when there was only 36 people in the church. So, number one, you got to know it comes from God. Anything you're adding to your life. Number two, you got to know who you are and who you're not. And number three, and I'm almost done, which is never true for a pastor. You got to know what you're called to do and what you're not called to do. Are you hearing me? I'm not called to lead this church. Man, listen, I'm telling you, I might have been the president, but I'm under this man's authority in this house. He's called to this leadership. You understand that? So don't tell him. I've never went to the dentist and said, you know, I've been reading on Google how to do it. And we, we as pastors, we get more advice from pap people from Google. So-and-so church over there is doing nothing. They didn't call us to do what so-and-so church. We're getting our marching orders from him, and we're moving forward in what we're called to do. Does that make sense? Last one, and I'm almost done. Almost means almost. Here we go. Number three, number four, is the verse that we all know, and that is verse 30 where it says, he must increase and I must decrease, verse 30. The fourth lesson that John the Baptist is sharing, I never heard anybody else preach this ever. Now, it doesn't mean people haven't preached it. I'm just saying I've never heard it. Because, see, when I read that, he must increase and I must decrease, I'm like, what is the fourth thing going on here? Because we know that. Because this is how I interpreted that. This is how I interpreted it all my life till that day on the couch in, in Africa. I interpret it this way. He must increase, and I must be a weasley, miserable, humble preacher. That's decrease. God said, get off that couch. Let me show you what it really means. He said, this is what it means. He must increase in you. And in order for that, you got to get out of the way to let him do it. The increase is in you. He must increase and I must decrease. And the increase is in you. That's what he said to me. So the fourth lesson that John the Baptist is telling his disciples, in my opinion, is, okay, if this is going to happen, divine addition is going to happen in my life. It's going to happen in this church. He's got to come in and take over. 
He's got to increase in you. Is that good or what? I love that. So guess what? I said, what does that mean? That's what you should be asking right now. Pastor asked if I was going to have an altar call. I'm not going to have an altar call. I'm going to give you a challenge to go home and do some homework with this message. If you haven't memorized it, go ahead online and look at it. We did. We did four or five sermons. They're really good. Here's what you do. God, how do you want to increase in me? So I started doing that. I started saying, okay, God, how, what, what do you want me to do? And, and this is what he said. He said, okay, let me talk to you about leadership. I think you need to increase in leadership. Now, you don't know me. But if you knew me, you know that that's my topic. Because I love pastors and I want to help them through leadership, right? So I'm like, God, what are you talking about, leadership? What are you picking on that for? I, I know leadership. He said, yeah, you know leadership, but I want to increase in you. In order for that to happen, you got to decrease. Yeah, but I've read John's book how many times? It's uh, developing the leaders around you, developing the leaders within you. He said, well, I have a better book. And he said, that book says, awaken the leader that's already in you. That's a different deal. That's a whole different deal. It's one thing to develop a leader in me, but it's another thing to let him lead through me whole different thing to awaken that leader and say, Lord, how would you lead this situation? John the Baptist says it this way, and John Maxwell says it this way, and uh, this person says it this way. T.D. Jake says it this way. I don't care who you live. Here's the end of the day. He said, well, let me show you what I do. And it has changed my leadership to awaken the leader within me. Another thing, I'm a, uh, you probably are picking up on at least some of this, I love people. And unless you're hatched on a rock by a chicken, you're a people. And I just love people. And he said, I want to teach you how to love people more. Now, this is the one that cut my throat when I said I got a decrease. I said, what do you mean, God? Every, everybody knows I'm a people person. I, I told the, these guys yesterday, I, I told them, I said, to, I told Corey and Anne, I could talk to the wall for a half hour. God said this, you love the people you want to leave, but you're ignoring people I never ignore. When you go into Starbucks, you don't want to talk to people that aren't like you. Well then, I'm getting a lesson. I'm getting a lesson that I must decrease and his love for people, which is much better than mine, must increase. And I don't know, there's certain people, listen, listen, please listen to me. There's certain people that we all avoid. Some of them are in your family. But he never stopped loving them. Hello. And I had to, I had to hear that from the Lord. And the Lord started teaching me, instead of being critical because they don't, act like Christians yet because they're not Christians. Love them. While you were yet a sinner, I died for you. Don't judge them. Learn to love them. And it set me on a course. Now I, I, I'm, I'm, I get free lattes out of this deal. <laughs> I'm being funny. That's not the reason, okay? <laughs> All right? You know what? I'm, I'm comical. If, if I try to make a joke, I, I mess it up. It's just who I am. And sometimes I, I say things, and later on, somebody's mad at me. I do it to help you laugh, just to open you up. And I already know who you are, so don't try now. Um, but at the end of the day, I, I, I got to be me. I gotta be, you know, I can't be you and I can't be the way you want me to be. I gotta be me. And that's the second point. Try not to be anybody you're not. Be you. First point is make sure that what I am saying is from God. You see what I'm saying? Third point, 
don't be over in somebody else's lane. I might be in charge of a lot as the president, but when I come to this house, I'm under his lane. Does that make sense? And then the last thing, let him increase in me. Can I pray for you before we have that music go? Do you like to play behind me? Because that makes it even more spiritual. Go ahead. All right. All right, you ready? See that? She sets the spirit come in now. It's playing. All right, here we go. Let me pray for you. Just, just close your eyes for a second. How many of you today, keep your eyes closed so that other people can't see. You can't see what other people are responding. If, how many of you here, here would love to have a divine increase in your life today? Right? Something divinely added to your life. Amen. Some of you. That's good. Well, Father, I pray for those who raised their hands and those who didn't. I ask you, God, to help them know today that you want to bless them and you want to divinely increase their lives. Help them not just get something from a good book. Help them receive something directly from you, that it comes from heaven. Lord, help them realize that you didn't make any, you didn't make two of them. You only made one of them, and you're, they are important. They might not feel it, but we're not going on feelings. We're going on the truth, because that makes people free. And we ask you, Lord, to help people today just be settled with who they are and who they're not. And Lord, help them know that they're called, not to everything, that they got to stay in their own lane, stay out of other people's field, and just get their marching orders from you and divine leadership over them. And then finally, Lord, may you help us all decrease so that you will increase in us. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.